All right, good evening. Good evening. Good to have you in the sanctuary. Now, tomorrow we'll do everything out there, but I need the ladies to be cleaning up. And, uh, nothing like the distraction of ladies cleaning up in the kitchen while you're trying to speak. So I didn't want that. So uh, we're, we're delighted that you're here. That you're guest with us tonight. We're thankful that you're here. Also thankful for our, our members. Now, I'm going to tell you if you got the call out today. How I many of you got the call out today? So you're, you want to know some information about the building that maybe everyone else doesn't know, or actually nobody knows about this, but at 10 a.m. on uh, Wednesday morning, we're going to sign the note with the, uh, with the bank, so that will be finalized. So what that means is one week from this Sunday, we will be breaking ground. Long time coming, and all God's people said, "Amen." Right? And so we're excited about March the 11th. It's also our deacon ordination that day. It's also the day we'll pray over our mission team going to Ghana, and uh, over the dresses we'll give away, and all kinds of things are going to happen on March the 11th. So we're uh, we're excited about about that day coming up. But I'm excited about tonight. If you got the call out, you know I told you just come thirsty, come thirsty for the Word of God. God's going to speak through this. God's, God's going to change lives through this weekend. I believe that. I'm excited uh, to be ministered to. You know, the pastor doesn't get that real often, and so I'm excited about that. We're going to sing a couple songs, and, and we will take up a, a love offering tonight. There will be a place to give tomorrow as we have our sessions tomorrow. We'll take up a love offering on Sunday morning as well. All of it goes to uh, the cost of the conference and Brother Tom and for his expense and all those things. <coughs> so give as the Lord leads you to give in that time. When that time comes, Brother Roger is going to come and introduce our speaker to us. Uh, he knows him much better than I do, although, as you've already heard, um, we, we know a lot of the same people, too. So uh, I asked Roger when we walked in here, I said, where's Brother Tom? He said, well, he's back there talking to more people he knows. So, uh, <laughs> but listen, let's get started with a word of prayer, and then Brother Paul's going to lead us in worship. Father, again, Father, we come to you, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for being our God. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins, and Father, help us to walk closer with him because of this conference. Father, you use with the time when it comes his time to speak to us, and Father, you just speak through him as a willing vessel for your word. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for the awesome privilege to sit in your presence, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Paul, you come. Would you stand together this evening for sing at Calvary? Sure. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing that it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy that was great and grace was free, pardon that was multiplied to me.
has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. to the Lord who can question any of his words who can teach the one who knows all things who can fathom all his wondrous deeds behold our God seated on his throne Some, uh, some false image of, of, of a God that we serve, Lord, because the truth of who you are is far greater than anything we could begin to imagine. So, Lord, I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you for your greatness, and I pray, Lord, that you would minister to us tonight, dear Lord, that you would speak to our hearts through your word, Lord, and, and draw us into a deeper relationship with you as a result of what happens here. Lord, take this offering once again, Lord, that it may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As the offering is being taken this, this evening, would you join us in one last song? Sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. <laughs> the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing a song again, whatever may pass and whatever has before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, for 
You know, there's been a commercial on TV, and I can't say I like it, but it applies for tonight. Y'all have all seen that fruit cup commercial about drinking the juice. The, you drink from your fruit cup, it's 100% juice. You know, what's the option is having something that's not 100%, something that's fake. Well, you know, I cannot think of what applies to this week than that. Someone, would we want someone to come and talk to us about a spiritual awakening and prayer that would be a fake? Someone who can tell us about it, someone who has read about it, can be a fake. But Dr. Tom is 100%. It's someone who lives in prayer, walks in prayer, and walks with the Spirit. And that's what I want. 100% original. You know, we're taking experience in God, many of you, and just talking about God wants that personal and real relationship. We will see that in these next days as we rub shoulders and Listen to Dr. Tom Ellis teach us, guide us, encourage us, and urge us into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior. And so it's a privilege that I have to introduce Dr. Tom Ellis to this body of Christ. Thanks, Roger. I sat there and asked myself, who is he talking about? <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's Dr. Tom business, unless you want surgery. Brother Tom or Tom, just call me something, I don't know. And I want to take just a moment to tell you that uh, I don't know all of you ladies who did the cooking for us tonight, but somebody told me a long time ago, you know, I, I get around to a lot of different churches, they said, Brother Tom, when you go to these churches and they have potluck, make sure you always eat the food that's made by the lady with the two front names, like Billy Lou, Mary Jo, <laughs> Betty Sue, not the hyphenated last name, like uh, Joanne Smith hyphen Hawkins. Did she stop by and bought hers on the way to church? <laughs> Billy Lou, Mary Jo, no. Uh, she, she made it. She knows. So find out. Apparently, everything on my plate was made by those ladies, I'll guarantee you, it, it was delicious. I think we ought to give them a hand. They, they did a great job. I appreciate your pastor. He's right. If we hang around long enough, we're going to find out that we're related. I mean, we hadn't been in a conversation three minutes, and he called the name of my first cousin, and I didn't even know we were related. So, uh, preacher, I'm probably going to find out some things that I know about you. I'll call some of my friends back in uh, <laughs> South Arkansas. And, uh, I'll find out the truth before the, before the weekend is over. Roger, thank you and Linda for the invitation. And uh, Diana and I are, we're blessed to be here. I'm going to take a few moments in a minute to explain what I think the mission is for the next uh, few hours that we spend together. I will tell you that uh, uh, Diana and I share 33 grandkids. So pray for us. Uh, I have 25 grandkids and five groups, and she has eight grandkids. All of our kids are in ministry one way or the other, and we're excited about that. We praise the Lord for that. And uh, I'll tell you, a year ago last December 6th, a bleak day in uh, Oklahoma City, my wife had been deceased about a year and a half uh, earlier, and uh, I wrote in my journal, Dear Lord, I guess you're calling me to be a single man, and I know you'll give me the grace to do that. And then I'm going to tell you, I closed my journal, and I began to cry. I'm not that kind of a person, but I began to cry. And I said, Lord, I'm so lonely. Do you have anyone for me? And the phone rang. <laughs> and if I'm lying, I'm dying. That's exactly how it is. The phone rang. And this lady on the other end, rather awkwardly said, is this Tom Ellett? And I said, yes. And lo and behold, uh, if you knew the whole story, how the Lord had put that on our heart, her husband had uh, said two weeks earlier, two weeks before he passed away, of Lou Gehrig's disease. In fact, he died um, at the Cove. And when you saw Billy Cram's casket there on the platform in the Cove, that's the last place he preached. And he preached there and then in the Cliff Barrows cabin, 
passed away of Lou Gehrig's disease. But we had met 35 years earlier in Salzburg, Austria. And um, how the Lord brought us back together is absolutely amazing. Don't mess up my dream, okay? Don't come tell me this is not going to work. We're having more fun than shooting rats at the sea dump. I'm just telling you. I have said to people, I don't want to be like that, uh, like that man that went to his pastor and said, Preacher, can a man be perfect on earth? And his pastor said, you mean live sinless, perfect? He said, no, no, Jesus did that, but no man. He said, are you sure? He said, no, no man can be perfect. He said, you ever meet my wife's first husband? <laughs> and uh, I told Diane, I don't, I don't want anybody to burst this bubble, okay? But we really are. We are. We are uh, we're so humbled to be here for these few hours with you. We're so grateful for this. And, we appreciate so very much the invitation. And, and uh, here's what I believe the mission is, okay? For the next few hours, I, I would just like to talk with you out of my heart about something that we all talk about, but very few people really do seriously until they're in trouble, and that is pray. And, and if I could just, if I could just, unburden my heart in these next few moments. Let, let me say that, that when most churches think about a crusade or about people coming to know Christ, they throw themselves into logistics and they begin to worry, how do we get the biggest crowd? And, and what most churches and most leaders fail to do is to understand that really everything happens through prayer. Everything happens through prayer. Everything. I was walking across the campus of our International Learning Center some time ago, and I heard this man say, Brother Tom, Brother Tom, and he came running across the campus, and he said, can I tell you my story? And I love stories. I love your story. You sit down, I listen to your story. And he said, can, can I tell you my story? And I said, well, sure. I want to hear your story. And we went in and sat down over a cup of coffee, and he said, here's my story. He said, my wife and I were called of God to go to a Muslim, actually an island. And he said, you know, that's scary. This is a place, he said, that was ardently, adamantly Islamic. He said, you could get in trouble. It, I mean, you could lose your life saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. But God called us to go there. And he said, uh, on, on the way there, he said, he said uh, we had determined that we were going to arrive as the sharpest swords we could be. He said, we trained. We went through everything that IMB had for us. We were ready to go. And he said, the first, year, first three years, he said, our first term, he said, we worked like sled dogs. He said, man, I mean, we did everything we knew to see people come to know Jesus in that hard, hard. Now, you think about your area compared to that area, your town compared to his town, okay? He said, we did everything we could to penetrate the darkness with the gospel. He said, at the end of three years, Guess how many people had gotten saved? And I leaned forward in my chair, and I said, how many? He said, none. I said, none. He said, you, you talk about despondent and depressed. He said, we came back home on furlough. He said, I, we talked seriously about quitting. We were just going to resign. Because he said, Southern Baptists had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars training us, sending us over there, all of our housing, getting us set up over there to be a we said, and and to have, he said, we knew we were going to go to these churches like yours and people were going to say, how many got saved? And he said, I, I, I manufactured this little story in my mind. I would say, I would say, well, you know, evangelism is really interesting. There's, there's plowing and then there's planting and there's watering and he, and he said, then there's harvest, and we're involved in the plowing, and the plan. all this is true. But he said, 
Brother Tom, he said, I'll just be honest with you. He said, we were ready to throw in the towel. I mean, this guy's looking me in the eyes. He, he was, I could tell it was emotional to him. And he said, uh, we were almost stateside. And he said, stateside did what it's supposed to do. It, it revived us. We realized we were really called there. So he said, we, uh, we did some more training. And we, we got everything together. And we went back overseas. And he said, uh, we gave it everything. Just everything. He said, first two years there, he said, he said, we worked just night and day, sharing every place we knew, every way we knew to share the gospel. We were sharing the gospel. He said, at the end of two years, he said, guess how many people have gotten saved? And I leaned forward in my chair again. I said, how many? He said, none. He said, now we have been Southern Baptist missionaries for six years. And we had nothing to show for it as far as we were concerned. And then I could just hear, I mean, he sighed. He said, at that point, we went to a conference. He named the city. I remember the city. I remember the conference, speaking at the conference. And he said, you, you spoke on desperate prayer and said, my wife and I got on the airplane and coming home back to our country where we were ministering, we said, that's, that's all we've got left. There's not anything else we can do except just pray. And he said, uh, we prayed like that for six months. And, and, and he said, at the end of six months, he said, uh, he said, I met a man who had been discharged from prison. And I shared the gospel with him. He came to know Christ. And he said, I thought, now I've got one. He said, I poured everything. He said, I, he said I'll guarantee you. He said, I, every, that guy was like drinking out of a water uh, fire hydrant. He said, that, I just gave him everything. He said, and I was ready when I came back on furlough. Somebody said, how many got saved? Well, let me tell you about one. And he said, I was going to just tell him all about this guy. He said, I was, I was ready. He said, six months later, that man came to me and said, uh, someone else that I knew in prison has been discharged. And would you share the gospel? He said, no, I won't share the gospel with him. You'll share the gospel with him. Let me show you how to do that. Let's talk about that. And so he said, he shared the gospel with him. He said, so that was at the end of three years over there. He said, then it's been several months and we, 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 just, we just threw ourselves into it. And he said, guess how many people have gotten saved? And I was afraid to ask. I wrote it down. He said, on the plane coming home, I could account for 300 new believers, 19 new churches, and 28 places where the gospel was preached every week by new converts. Amen. Now you think about how hard it is right here in Greer's Ferry. And you think about what that man's desperate prayer did. Think about that. Think about that. In, in, in a few moments, I want to tell you about what I believe is the fastest. Or there are two really rapidly growing church planting movements on the globe right now. And I'm going to tell you about one that you, and when you hear the role of prayer in that, it will blow your mind. And so you see, what we try to do is every, everything we try to do is on top of the ocean when there are these strong undercurrents beneath the sea that are necessary. And one of those is prayer. And if, if at the end of these few hours, listen, if at the end of these few hours that we spend together, there could be a few, one here, there, someplace else, who said, I, I will do that. I I can do that. I, I can do that. I will, I will do that. I mean, you might even come to a point where you say, we need to organize this. But I can, I can do that. You would say, I can do that. We can do that. My husband and I, my wife and I, we can do this. If, if just a handful would start doing that. I will tell you what, 
I would drive down this highway back to Oklahoma City, a deliriously happy man, and Diana would be a deliriously happy lady because it would be an answer to our prayers. So I want you to open your Bible. If you will. Here's what I'd like to do. Tonight, I'm just going to speak this one time, and I'll, I'll do everything I can to make it as brief as possible. You have eaten, and after I eat, I usually go to sleep. And so, uh, we have dined, and I'm going to do everything I can to keep you awake for a few minutes here, and then we'll be dismissed and be back here in the morning, and uh, on three different occasions in the morning. We'll feed you in the morning. Before and after, all right? But I pray that during that time, you'll be fed spiritually. And oh, I'm, I'm just praying. Every See, when a preacher preaches, he's like an attorney arguing a case before a jury. And I'm arguing for a verdict. I mean, an attorney doesn't go argue that big case and say, okay, night, y'all, go home. No, he, he wants a verdict. And I, I tell you, I am praying that some of you all will make the right verdict in your hearts when it comes to the issue of prayer. The issue of prayer. So if you will, open your Bible to Luke chapter 11. Luke's Gospel chapter 11. We could wallow around in uh, two or three chapters right here together, but we'll just look at one passage of Scripture beginning with verse 1 of Luke chapter 11. <coughs> Now, I'll, 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 when I'm teaching, it's sort of like this. Um, if I wanted to feed you, let's say an orange, I wouldn't come up and just jam it down your throat. I wouldn't his. I want him to live. He's so good on that box up there. And all that <laughs> stuff. I, I don't know how they do that. That's talent. That's a gift is what that is. But I wouldn't just jam this orange down. I would... I would take the rind, you'd recognize this orange, I'd take the rind back, think of the context of a passage of scripture, and then you'd see in the case of an orange, it's pretty neatly segmented, so I'd let it fall apart, and I'd feed him a bite at a time. So what we'll do is just, in, in each of these sessions, we'll just walk through a passage and just let it like that. We'll take back the context, and then we'll see how it's pretty neatly arranged, and we'll just get some nourishment bite at a time. All right, does that make sense? So here you have uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. And we read that it happened that while Jesus was praying, now let me just stop there. And I say this as an aside. Why is it that what Jesus talked about so much and did so much of, why is it that we talk about it but we don't do it? And I'm talking about prayer. If, if I were to name the, 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 the men and women God used mightily in this world, they all have one commonality, and that is prayer. Here's George Mueller, who would never ask for anything. He would say, My, our bank account's always full. Our, our pantry's always full. And he would have... Orphans, he's fed and clothed over 2,000 orphans and educated them and housed them solely in answer to prayer. He would have them pray the blessing sometime at breakfast when there was nothing in the kitchen and before they finished praying, there'd be a knock at the door and somebody would be there with wagons of food saying, I made a mistake, was supposed to cater a party last night. You know, can you use this? Incredible. David Brainerd, who prayed... He said, one day, he said, when I knelt to pray, the snow was at my shoulders, and when I finished my prayers, I couldn't touch the snow with the tips of the fingers on my outstretched arm. And incredible, the, the, the move of God on the East Coast, great revival, early awakening, came in the prayers of David Brainerd. And what about Hudson Taylor, who, who you know, back in those days, uh, mail was just handed in. He was in the China Inland Mission, in the guts of China, and just trusting God in prayer. And, and, and by the way, for three years, he was supported almost entirely by George Mueller, who had enough on his plate with the orphans, but he was supporting 
Hudson Taylor in, in China. Do you trust your prayer life like that? Or is prayer sort of like the last coat of paint you put on what you've built? Okay, let's, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, well, before we go, let's, somebody say a little prayer for us. Let's say a little prayer. Somebody close with a word of prayer. Just, a, just another brush of paint on our work. Right? So, so Jesus prayed at the outset of his ministry. He prayed all through his ministry, sent people away so he could pray, stole away, as we see here, so he could pray, prayed on the eve of his crucifixion, prayed on the cross, prayed after his resurrection. Our eternal security is related directly to the fact that he ever lives, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And why is it? He did so much of it. We do so, so little of it. But God can find a church. I mean, right here in central Arkansas, if, if God can find some people who will pray, those stories will be this church's story. <coughs> that, that's right. But the key is how will you respond? So it said, we read here that G, while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Now, now, if you're a grammarian here, to pray, that's an infinitive. But what it tells us is that prayer is something we do, not, not something we philosophize about, not something we merely assent to, not something we agree is important, not something we sing hymns about, sweet hour of prayer. Teach us what? To pray. Teach us to do it, just as John also taught his disciples. So, in Jesus' answer, we see three things. First of all, let, let's just look at it. First of all, we see what I want to call this evening the elements of prayer. The elements of prayer. Jesus gives them what we often call the model prayer, sometimes wrongly called the Lord's Prayer. That's found over in John's Gospel verse chapter 17. But here, he said to them, this is the model prayer, it's sort of the Cliff Notes version of, of the full-blown model prayer, which we would find in, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not in temptation. I mean, that, that's just the short form version. But, but you see here what we, what we could call the elements of prayer. And I don't want to park here very long because this is not where I'm headed with this passage. But, but what, what's in prayer? Look at it real quickly with me. First of all, there's reverence for the person of God. Father, hallowed be your name. I am. I have been impacted by my wife's prayer life. And one of the things I noticed right off the bat when we first started courting and began to believe that God had something in store for us, I noticed that, that when we vowed to pray, it was as if my wife had to have a little time to go, you could see it really almost physically, to get inside a closet and close the door and bow before God. You know, I say, I, say, I would say, let's pray together. Father, I just want to pray. And I'd just start praying. And I'd say, you know, you pray and she'd say. And I began to realize after a little bit that there was something that she had in her prayer life that I did not have. And that she had a deeper reverence for God. Hallowed be your name. I, I am entering into the presence of the creator and the sustainer of the universe. He has to give my heart permission to take its next beat. Reverence for the person of God. 
recognition of the purpose of God. That's the second thing. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's the whole purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is not to get what we want. The purpose of prayer is to get what God wants into this world through us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. I had a friend, preacher, I had a friend who used to call me, his name is Manly Beasley, and he would call me all the time and he would say, well, what's God teaching you? I got so tired of that. I'd make stuff up. Now, honestly, I'd just lie to him. I'd just, just get him off my neck, you know. And one day I told him, I said, well, Brother Manley, God's taught me how to get everything I want. And boy, it got really sad, Simon. I said, you're kidding. Or he said, you're kidding. I said, nah. And, and I said, no, really. And, and I was telling him the truth. God had shown me this. He said, that sounds sort of commercial. I said, no. I finally learned how to get what I want, everything I want. He said, would you care to share that with me? I said, well, I'm not there yet. But if I could just get to the point in my life where all I wanted for my life was simply all he wanted for my life, then all my life I'd have all he wanted. All, all I wanted, and he'd have all of me he wanted. But the key is getting to the point in life where all I want is simply all he wants. Your kingdom come. You get the picture? Your will be done on earth. Where do you find that? In the, in the Word of God. The plans of God are revealed to the man or woman of God by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. So there's, there's a recognition of the purpose of God. And then there's a request for the provision of God. Notice the three things he said. Give us our daily bread. He asked also for forgiveness and a forgiving spirit. And then he asked for deliverance from temptation and from the tempter, if you look at the larger version in Matthew 6. And then finally, if you looked in Matthew 6, you'd see the fourth element, and that is rest in the preeminence of God. And yours is a kingdom. It starts and ends with God. Yours is a kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It says in Matthew 6, 13. Amen. Now, I don't want to park there, but just let me just say that those are the elements of prayer. They ought to be in, in your praying, in my praying, okay? Now, Second, I, I, the second thing I want to talk about is, is, is a little more prominent to me in this passage. And it, it's, it's interesting because it was obviously more prominent to Jesus and it's the real answer to the question, teach us to pray. And that is the exercise of prayer. So we see the elements of prayer, then we see the exercise of prayer. That prayer is not something we endorse Prayer is not something we say, okay, somebody's praying, let's bow our head. It's not something we just agree. We can agree with others in prayer, but it's not, I believe in this. Prayer is something we do. Teach us to pray. Teach us to do it. And it would revolutionize this church if out of these few hours there arose a, a nucleus of people who did it who actually did it so that your pastor, when he steps in the pulpit, would know this week it hadn't been just people who believe in prayer and want to pray, and it, people who did it, who prayed. And I can expect when I preach God to do what he wants to do because they have bowed before him, agreed with him in prayer. So what it, about this exercise of prayer? Jesus, Jesus uh, answers their question by giving them two things. He gives them a parable, and then he follows that with the principle, okay? So let's look at the parable, and then let's look at the principle that, that undergirds everything. Okay, here's the parable. And you know what a parable is. Para means alongside. Ekbalo in the Greek language means something thrown alongside. Think of a mirror that you put behind, uh, maybe behind your head to show that ball spot that's back there that nobody else sees. Or behind a box so you can see the back. You, you get a different perspective. Well, that's what a parable is. Jesus was speaking parables so that we could, we could see things with a different perspective, from a different perspective. 
And so he throws down this story. He tells this story. Jesus loved to tell stories, okay? And so he said, Here, here's, the, here's the story. And I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try to fill in all the blanks here that the disciples would have understood. In their culture, in their culture, when anyone showed up at your house, unless they were a sworn enemy, you had an obligation. And you, it, to this day, it's true. You were obliged to be hospitable and to feed them and to meet their need. If they showed up at your house, knocked on your door, the answer was yes. So here's a man who has had a friend come to him at midnight. Now because of the culture, he has, he has no choice about whether to invite him in and he has no choice about whether to meet his needs. The problem is he doesn't have a way to meet his needs. He has no food. So he has invited this person in and apparently now he's told him, if you'll just sit still and, and, and drink this Coke or whatever, uh, I'm going to run, I'll be back in just a minute. And he goes down the street to the house of a friend of his who's married and has children, so he knows he's bound to have food. And what does he do? He, uh, <coughs> he, he, he knocks on the door softly. It's sort of the way it goes. And, and nothing. And then he, he knocks a little bit more. Nothing. So he backs up and says, Hey, hey! And inside there's a voice that says, What in the world are you doing? Well, I've got a friend who came to me and I don't have any food. Can you help? Are you kidding me? My wife's asleep. My kids are asleep. Good gracious, man. Go away. He just backed up. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Well, I just told you. I've got somebody down in my house. I can get away from here. Don't wake me. Unless you're waking me up, you're going to wake my neighbors up. Hey! Hey! Now, by the way, lest you think otherwise, you need to see his persistence as a compliment. It's an expression of his confidence in the heart of his friend. Pretty soon he hears those footsteps coming down the stairs, the door opens, out comes a hand with a bunch of loaves in it, and Jesus, he said, look, he didn't do that because he was his friend. He did it because of his much speaking, his persistence, his persistence. Now, Jesus said that story, that story is to explain the importance of praying according to this principle. Now notice what the scripture says. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. And by the way, in the original language of the scripture, it's a repetitive ask. Ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you'll find. Knock and keep on knocking and it will be open to you for everyone who asks in that fashion and keeps on asking, receives. And everyone who knocks or seeks and keeps on seeking will find everyone and knocks and keeps on knocking, it will be open. Listen, folks. Jesus is saying, your Heavenly Father is so much better and closer and tender and caring and able than any earthly friend you ever had. But that man walked home that night with those loaves under his arm because he went to someone who had the answer and persisted in asking. And Jesus is saying prayer, prayer is not something you just think about. Prayer is something you do. One day, seated on the beach in Hawaii, can you get a picture of an old man I mean, good gracious alive. I'm 74. White legs. <laughs> you know, laying back, doing what old people do, reading a book. And I heard this noise. Man, crack, 
crashing, this crash. I mean, man, there was a thunderous noise. And I looked over to my right, and there was a cliff falling into the ocean where the waves had beat again. I mean, it was just tons, if not hundreds of tons, falling into the ocean. And, and my wife said, boy, that must have been a big wave. And I said, no, that was not a big wave. As a matter of fact, the, the tide was going out. The ocean was rather classic. You know what brought down that impregnable fortress of stone? Not a wave, but wave after 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 big wave after little wave after wave after wave after wave after wave after week waves a month of waves a year wave after wave after wave till one day at just the right moment that little bitty wave said hey. And all of a sudden, that impregnable fortress of rock came falling into the sea. Do you get the picture? I don't know where that's coming from, but it's a nice one. It's all right. Do you get the picture? I don't want this to be lost on you. Do you get the picture? Let me try something else now that you're paying attention. How many of you put on your seatbelt when you drove to church tonight? I'll be honest with you. Okay, that's good. That, hey, that's pretty good. How many of you put on your seatbelt because you love the way it feels? It just fits you so perfectly. It is just so comfortable. Why did you put on that seatbelt? Is it because it's comfortable? No. You put that seatbelt on because in your car there's a little gizmo. That's, if you don't, it says, hey, 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 hey. So just... Put the stick in seat. Belt, right? <laughs> the, the, the power of persistence. Now the goal here, the issue here, is not overcoming a God who is reluctant. Jesus is using an earthly story to talk. He said, if you do that, if, if you, because of your persistence, <coughs> reap the benefit of a faithful friend, what would happen if you threw yourself into the activity of prayer? So here's the exercise of prayer. Now, one last thing, and then we go home just sort of meditate on this tonight. And it's what I would call the expectation of prayer. And I'll tell you the story in just a little bit. You're going to have a hard time believing it. But if it can happen, where it happens. It can happen right here. Yes, it can. It can happen right here. The expectation of prayer. If you have your Bible, you would see that it looks like Jesus just changes horses in the middle of the stream. I mean, all of a sudden he starts talking about he starts talking about stuff like snakes and fish and eggs and scorpions. He said. What is he talking about? He, listen to this. He said, suppose one of you fathers, and by the way, that gives us a reminder that the disciples were not just a bunch of single guys with nothing to do. Some of them had children, right? Suppose one of you fathers, he's speaking to them, okay, so some of them, and some of them had children. We know that, we know that uh, Peter must have been married, which is interesting. He's called the first pope, but he, he'd been married, obviously, because he had a mother-in-law. We read about his mother-in-law. Somebody told me the other day the penalty for polygamy is more than one mother-in-law, <laughs> I just heard that and said it. Okay, suppose, he says, one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. Dad, give me a fish. He'll not give him a snake instead of a fish. What is Jesus talking about? Give him a snake instead of a fish? What is he, what is he talking about? Or if he asks, your son comes and asks for an egg. You're not going to give him a scorpion, will he? And then he says, if you then, Here's the contrast again. Being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? See, it's a, if, if that guy reaps the benefit of persistence from his friend, look, if you know how to give good gifts to your own children, sinful men that you are, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask it? So, so just in closing, let me just say there, there are two things you have every right to expect 
when and if you actually pray. Okay? When you pray. If you pray. There are two things you can, you can expect the Lord to do. First of all, you can expect Him to respond according to His character. You see, this, this part of the, this statement, if you then being evil, how much more? That's a, that's a contrast of character. And so you, he says, you can expect Jesus to do the kind of things in the kind of way that Jesus did. You can expect your Heavenly Father to do what your Heavenly Father can do. You can expect a friend. If you as an earthly father would do this, what would your Heavenly Father do? When you pray, when I pray, this is what Diana is, is sent the telegraph that she's sending to me. I'm entering, this is God is my audience, the holy God. Years ago, there was a story, I think it's apocryphal, okay, so I'm not really sure that it's true. It's told for the truth. I can imagine it could have been true, but I don't know. But the story is told that uh, the, some years ago, probably 25 years ago, Saudi Arabians decided to put in golf courses, which I know they did that. They did that. And uh, so when they did, this will show you how long ago it was, they asked Arnold Palmer to come over and play a series of exhibition matches at seven different golf courses, which they did. Okay? I mean, I like to play golf. My number one rule of golf is don't pick up a lost ball until it stops rolling. So, don't play on the same time I play. Anyway, uh, so here's, they, Arnold Palmer goes, he's a millionaire, he's a golfer. Of course, famous. So he goes over and plays seven exhibition matches. At the end of which, the prince of Saudi Arabia throws a banquet in his honor. And at the banquet, he says, we are so glad you're here. And this has been such a wonderful treat for us. And I want to give you a gift. What would you like? Well, see, we don't do that. We give people what we think they would like so they can sell it at a garage sale. You know, <laughs> season season. But, but in the Middle East, in fact, you see this in the scripture. What would you like up to half my kingdom? You see, they ask you what you want. Well, Palmer didn't understand. He said, oh, no, you know, I don't know what he said. Mr. King, it's been good being here with you and your people or something like that. I don't know what he said. His interpreter looked at him and said, you've insulted the king. You see, in our culture, the way you show what you think of the king's largesse, of his character, is revealed by your request. Boy, now that's, that's interesting, isn't it? What do your requests of God show about what you think of his ability? So Palmer got it. He didn't really get it. He, he sort of got it. He said to the king, he said, on second thought, he said, I would like a gift. He said, I'd like a golf club. He said, like a nine iron putter driver, something like that. Can you imagine his surprise? The next morning, the king just beamed, you know. Next morning, an attorney showed up at his room with a deed to a golf course. A club. An entire club. All 18... Holes, water holes, everything else, it's yours. Now, what's, what's the lesson there? When you're in the presence of a king, ask for big stuff. What do our prayers show we think of God? I've been impressed with a family recently. That he's a pastor in Oklahoma whose son has literally been immobile for almost two months now. And he and his family and that church family have literally prayed that boy out to the point that he's now communicating with his parents and responding physically to, to commands. I mean, what if they just said, well, you know, we take everybody's word at this, we just leave at this, you know, we're going to... No, listen, when you're in the presence of the king, ask for big things. What are you asking for your church? What do you, what do you ask when your pastor preaches on what are you asking for this Sunday morning? I would pray that this Sunday morning, when we gather to worship, that there'd be some people here who saw the Billy Graham funeral and decided to go to church. 
People who need to get saved. Wouldn't you want them? Wouldn't it be great? I mean, if you brought your friend, what are you praying? What are you praying for? You can expect God to ask to answer according to his character. If you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more did your father have? Secondly, you can expect God to respond in a measure that's commensurate with his capacity. He is the creator. He's the sustainer of the universe. Jesus said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father has the ability to give the Holy Spirit. He said, you can ask for stuff. Go ahead, in that prayer, ask for stuff. But he's willing to give you himself. He is willing to pour himself into you. Now let, let me just let me just close with this tonight and let you think about it. Okay. <coughs> I, I'm a man on a mission. I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I don't have I don't know how long I have to live, but I want to use every bit of my life to the glory of God and to encourage people to do the things that I think are critically important. And I think prayer is critically important. And people, I, 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 listen, there's no such thing as little churches or big churches. They're just little people and big people. And there's big churches with little people in it. They just think small. They want to, there's, there's small churches with big people. In it. They've got the world on their heart. They can see around this world. They want to see God go to work. Well, I'm just praying God will find the big hearted people in this church. Let me just give you an idea of what can happen. Got all these churches, you know, we, Diane and I came, I guess it's the back way. If it's not the back way, I'd hate to see the back way. <laughs> we turned off of Interstate 40 over there, started making our way through, you know, all these, you know, they're all, they're your neighbors, they're not my neighbors, but you know, we came through, through all these towns, you know, the signs that said, you know, population variable. Um, <laughs> So, everybody has these ideas of what can be accomplished and how many people it takes to accomplish it. A few years ago, a few years ago, I, uh, I was on my knees in a dark room. Nine other, there, there are nine nationals in a North African town. I mean, you talk about a tough, you want to you go in a tough place to witness? Go into deeply embedded Islam and just try, well, I'll share with you how tough it was. Guy came over and put his hands on my head and prayed over me. Prayed over, my wife was with me, prayed over. Not, not too long, but a year or so after that, Somebody came to me and said, and called his name and said, do you remember him? I said, well, I sure did. Well, I remember getting on with him, putting his hands on my head. I remember in that room there was a lady whose face was beaten to a pulp because she, her husband had beaten her the night before because she had become a believer. And our missionary was always saying, are you doing, are you doing this? And they were all, we're doing our best to do exactly what you're telling us to do. We're trying to do this. So, God, he called, he called his name. He said, do you remember so? And I said, oh, yeah. He said, you pray for him. I said, I think it's going with him. He said, well, it's a little tough for him right now. I, I'm just going to talk to you about tough here for a little bit, whatever obstacle you think you've got in your mind. I said, really, how, how is it tough for him? He said, well, he said uh, three weeks ago, he was, he was reading the NGO, reading the scripture to his 12-year-old daughter. And his dad, they live in a compound. You, all families live in a compound. And his dad walked by and saw him reading the scripture. And anyway, he went to work, came home, and his dad had killed his daughter. Just kind of a grandfather kill his 12-year-old daughter. Now that's how, you want to talk tough? We'll just talk about tough here for a little bit. Tough to, to live in that compound and live out your faith in front of a dad who killed your daughter? But see, but see, these people did something that that very few people do. I mean, they just really pray. One day our missionary said, uh, 
this little band of brothers there, and are you doing one of them? And, and Mitch, one of them stood up and said, wait. And he went outside and called for a taxi cab. And he put this man, you're, you're missionary, he put this man and his wife in a car, in a taxi cab, and said, come with me. And they started riding through this town in the streets of this North African city. And this missionary of yours is saying, I am dead. And they rode out the city limits. And he said, they're, they're going to murder us and drop us in a ditch. Now, I don't know what your obstacles are here to have a seeing dozens and hundreds of people saved. saved. <coughs> talking to you here. And he's thinking, I, we're dead, my wife. What about our kids are back home and we're, we're going to die? And they rode outside this town and got out to the point where the road got sort of desolate and it was out and there were gullies and hills and trees and bushes and, and the guy said, lean forward and grab the cab driver and said, stop. And they pulled that cab up and stopped. He said, get out. That missionary got out and his wife, he said, stand right here. And he got in front of me and he said, you, you keep asking us, are you doing what I'm asking you to do? Pray to share. You keep asking us, are you doing? And he turned around to this empty valley and went, <whistles> and when he did, hundreds of believers came out from behind trees and bushes Hundreds, first, second, and third generation believers. And right now, one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing church planting movement in the world is taking place among Muslims in North Africa. Yeah. Few then be evil. Know how to give good gifts to your own kids. How much more does your Father in Heaven know how to give good gifts to you? And Jesus said it all in answer to a simple question. Teach us to do it. Teach us to pray. And I'm under no illusions. I'm not even, not even tomorrow when we gather tomorrow. Because, you know, it, it, it's sort of a weeding out process, really. It surprises you how scared people get when they think about what it takes to pray effectively. But think what could happen. Just dream for a minute. What could happen if God just found a handful of people who would say, teach us to do it. Teach us to do it. And Father, that is my prayer. I believe it's the pastor's prayer. I know it's the Rutgers' prayer. I know it's Diana's prayer. I believe it's the prayer of others in this church. Teach us, God, to do it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. See you in the morning. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we'll start from in the morning at 9 a.m. Uh, men, men, I need you to come about 8. We're going to serve breakfast in the morning. My ladies, don't get too excited. It's just donuts, all right? <laughs> <laughs> guys, those of you who can come and serve and help prepare for you, but I've been challenged so far. What a challenging, challenging uh, message. Go home, get some rest. Okay, so one nice last thing. There's a table back here with books. Uh, there's, I think, six different titles. Is that right for the time? $10 a book. And we'll have a basket there. You just make your own change. If you want a book, grab a book. Different titles. So they're back there. Just be aware. Pick some up for the conference all ends. Yeah, they're there.